As Emily mentioned, my name is Dan Pouts. I'm a partner at uh, Bonshanik and King in Syracuse in our litigation practice. I'm also friends with or familiar uh, or represent many of you on the call. I looked at the registration page and uh, I saw a lot of familiar faces. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and thank you to Emily, who's been most gracious with her time and her expertise in getting this set up. Thank you also to Jeff Canifick for helping in that regard as well. Uh, first, before we get into the substance of anything, and most importantly, um, I hope that all of you and your families are staying healthy and staying sane, uh, with the exception of my wife, who's been stuck inside for two months with me. Uh, everyone else I've spoken to seems to be holding up okay. So continued good health to you. Um, for the last, I guess, two months now, my, my partners, my colleagues, and I have spent nearly all of our time um, working with clients who are facing unique challenges and issues that were unimaginable six months ago. Uh, but on a daily basis, as we work through these issues, I have continuously been inspired by our clients' resilience, their creativity, and refusal to quit. That's been inspiring to me. It's been inspiring to my colleagues. And ultimately, I think that that type of can-do attitude and resilience is ultimately going to get us through this and going to allow all of us to come out of this stronger than we were. So kudos to you on that. Um, I also, to the extent that I haven't had the privilege of meeting you yet, um, a little bit about myself. I am was born and raised uh, in Horseheads, lived there the first 18 years of my life. Uh, I graduated from Notre Dame High School, been living in Syracuse for about 12 years now. But like you folks, uh, Shimon County is always and has always been home to me. Uh, and in that regard, I have several clients down there who I work with. I also have several family members and friends still down there. And that's sort of what led to this presentation today is that my colleagues and I have spent thousands of hours monitoring this COVID-19 crisis and, and developing strategies to help our clients with an endless list of legal and practical issues. Many of you have received our client memos or attended our webinars before. Uh, if not, all those materials are available. We have a, a special COVID-19 page on our website, so we'd encourage all of you to, to check that out. But since we work with a number of individuals and businesses in Shimon County, it made sense to put this presentation together and, and let you know and bring you in on the latest guidance that we're finding uh, as we all adjust to our new normal. As far as I know, Shimon County has been approved to begin phase one of the reopening process tomorrow. And the timing of this webinar couldn't be better because as many of you already know in the last 12 hours, uh, actually about eight o'clock this morning, uh, the state came out with uh, a ton of new details and information regarding the opening reopening process that my partner Adam Ashley was gonna talk about in a minute. Also last evening, um, the Small Business Administration came out with additional guidance and FAQs on the PPP loans, which also is a hot topic amongst our clients, and, and I'm sure many of you. And my partner, Paul Avery, will, will talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, so Adam Masterleo, he's, he's a member of our Labor and Employment Practice Group here in Syracuse. Uh, most importantly, the reason I asked Adam to join us today is he has led our COVID-19 business recovery group. Uh, and he actually just got through, we as a group just got through publishing an incredibly helpful and, and comprehensive document that touches on the, the legal, operational, and, and workforce issues that all of us are going to face in the coming weeks. Um, and in fact, when this webinar is over, uh, we're going to email everybody a copy of that document. Now, of course, based on the guidance that came through this morning, some of that may need to be updated, uh, but certainly we're around to help walk you through that process. Before I officially turn it over to Adam, uh, this is a little bit of a unique, we don't use WebEx very often, it's a little bit of a unique webinar in the sense that I'm sure by now many of you are tired of attending these webinars and just being talked to. Not that it's not helpful information, but I think it's th that that kind of process is getting a little bit stale, at least from our perspective. So we want this to be much more interactive and, and 
I want, I've asked the presenters to present a little bit of information at the beginning. Um, and then I have some questions for them based on the, the questions that we're getting from clients time and time again. And also, as Emily mentioned in the beginning, we would certainly encourage you to submit your questions on chat. Many of you submitted questions to me in the last couple of days. I really appreciate that. So we're going to work through this together. And, and I want to make this a truly interactive experience because the questions that you have, chances are many of your colleagues have the same questions that are also on the line. Um, so so this, these question, this Q&A session is, is going to be hugely beneficial, I hope, uh, to all of us on the call. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm pleased to introduce Adam Master Leo to talk about the reopening process. And thanks so much uh, and welcome everybody. Thank you all for attending this morning. Um, it is a, like Dan said, it is a great time to have this webinar uh, and to discuss the reopening process, particularly in Chemung County where you're approved to open in two days. Um, so this morning at about eight o'clock a.m., the state finally re released guidance for employers who are going to be reopening on what they need to do as part of the reopening process. And the guidance is, is fairly detailed, but I wanna start with a couple of questions that we, we got answers to, which will most likely be helpful to everybody. First of all, we know that every business is going to have to prepare a workplace safety plan if they're going to be open and operating. That's very clear now. This is going to apply to essential businesses, non-essential businesses that are going to be reopening, and non-essential businesses that were supporting essential businesses over the past couple of months. We also know that these workplace safety plans are not going to have to be submitted to any state agency for approval. The new guidance makes that clear. However, you are going to have to have a copy of your plan at your premises at all times in case the state DOL Department of Labor requests a copy. So we got answers to those two questions, which I know a lot of people uh, were wondering about. Now, the new guidance that the state put out is really broken into three categories. Uh, first of all, it's broken down by industry. So uh, phase one includes a number of industries. And for each industry, for example, construction, there are three new documents that the state has provided employers. Number one, the state has provided a chart that gives you a summary of the new rules and guidance. Uh, second, uh, each industry has a detailed guidance document. And what the state is requiring is that each business submit an affirmation at the end of this detailed document that says, uh, that identifies your business name and contact information and affirms that you have read and understand your obligation to engage or and cooperate with the guidance. So each business is gonna have to read through this guidance and then click on a box, a uh, checkbox at the end and fill out your information and say that you affirm that you're going to comply with the state's guidance. The third thing that the state is providing for each industry in phase one is a template for a reopening. plan. Now, I'm sure many of you have already started the process of reopening plans, putting them together, analyzing uh, your risks, but the state has now provided a template. The state makes it clear in the guidance that you don't have to follow the template specifically. You could have your own plan. I, I shouldn't say, uh, you do have to follow the template. This, the guidance says that you, have, you can have your own plan, or you can just fill out the, the template plan that the state's provided. So Dan, th those are the big updates. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, you have any questions for me. Yeah, thanks, Adam. That's that's helpful. And again, since this we were about you know a little over two hours into seeing this, so obviously there's going to be um, a, a period of time that we're going to have to review this. We're going to have to digest it. And I suspect that with everything else that's happened in the last two months, there's going to be continued updates and guidance um, as issues are identified and, and they come up. One question I have is the guidance that came out this morning. Uh, where can we get that? How can we access it? And is this template that you talked about, are these sort of plug and play documents that we can just download or, or, or fill them in by PDF. How, if, I'm, if I'm trying to put together a reopening plan, how do I access these documents? 
Okay, so the documents are accessed from the state's website. Um, if you go to, and, and we can put this link in our email to the participants, but it's uh, the New York Forward uh, website, and it includes very specific information for each industry um, that is part of phase one. Now, I should say that this raises uh, a number of questions. As with most guidance the state puts out, it answers some questions and it raises other, other ones. Um, essential businesses are not provided with these templates so, uh, or this affirmation. So if you've been an essential business, the guidance is clear that you need to have a workplace safety plan, but there isn't a template for you yet. So maybe that, that question will get answered um, at some point in the future. Um, I should say that uh, in working through workplace safety plans, you can use the state's form and you can walk through the form. Um, but there are a number of things that the form doesn't necessarily address that, that we feel are important to include in any workplace safety plan uh, for employers. So, for example, um, I would say that any workplace safety plan, whether you're using the state's form or your own uh, form that you're creating, you have to begin with a risk analysis. So you have to look at where in your business is there a risk of virus transmission? So it, does your business involve um, customers, interaction with customers? Does your business uh, operate in an office space where employees might uh, transmit the virus to one another? If that's the case, where in your business? Uh, typically, you know, you're going to think of commonly used areas such as break rooms, kitchens, conference rooms, things like that. So you're going to want to go through and really analyze in detail where in your business there is a risk of transmission. Once you've done that, then you can start to prepare the workplace safety plan. And uh, Dan, if it's all right, I, I can go through some of the topics that should be covered in those workplace safety plans based on the current guidance and what we have been working with clients on already. Yeah, that'd be great, thanks. All right. So. Workplace safety plans are going to have to include a number of things. Number one, you're going to have to address physical distancing or social distancing, whatever term you want to use. What measures are you going to take to help people stay six feet away from one another while they're working or to keep customers uh, more than six feet away from each other? Um, so you're going to look at possibly uh, staggering shifts, altering work hours, uh, bringing back your employees at a different rate. So you might only bring 25% of your workforce back up at first to make sure that you are uh, keeping the population in your office down, limiting exposure. Um, are you going to have uh, signage that requires foot traffic in a particular direction? Um, are you going to have um, uh, changes to the physical workspace. So if you have cubicles that have no separation between them and those cubicles are less than six feet apart, are you going to be able to do anything to maintain social distance? So it's, your plan is going to have to cover social distance. Your plan is also going to have to cover PPE, your personal protective equipment. The new guidance um, has made it pretty clear that businesses are going to have to provide uh, masks at the very least uh, to employees. There's there's really no wiggle room anymore. You know, it wasn't clear up until now, but masks are going to have to be provided. In fact, the new guidance asks employers to uh, tell or, or list on their workplace safety plan how many masks they're going to get and where they're going to get them from or what their plan is for procuring them. Plans are going to have to include uh, hygiene recommendations for employees cleaning and sanitization uh, recommendations for employees. These are going to have to follow the state and CDC guidelines. These plans are going to have to address communication, how you're going to communicate with employees, what you're going to communicate with employees about changes in policies, et cetera. Um, a new, uh, new piece of information that the guidance provides is that screening is also going to be required. Now, there has been some debate about whether or not self-screening is allowed uh, or if 
the employer is going to have to do some form of screening, whether it be taking in temperature or asking questions to all employees. Uh, the guidance, um, again, we haven't gone through it in detail yet, but it seems to indicate that some form of actual screening is going to take place, uh, not necessarily temperature, but it also lists questionnaires or asking questions as an option. Hey, Adam, let me cut you off one second because we did get a, a question in the chat and it's right on uh, pace with what you're talking about now. So in terms of a questionnaire, are you saying that the state at this point in time has not come out with guidance to say, you have to ask your employees these four questions or five questions before they get, a lot of us, if any of us have gone to the doctor's office in the last few months, we've gone in the front door and they've asked us, they've taken temperature, asked us four or five questions. Um, so is, is that something, is that similar to what uh, we as an employer are gonna have to do with our employees or we just don't know yet? So the guidance provides three questions um, that should be asked. One, have you had any COVID-19 symptoms in the past 14 days? And those symptoms are listed uh, by the CDC. Two, have you had a positive COVID-19 test in the 14, past 14 days? And three, have you had close contact with a confirmed or suspected case in the last 14 days? So those are the three questions that are listed in the current guide. One other thing, because we've been getting, um, I've, I've been getting a lot of these questions over the last couple of days. Um, including from, from participants in this webinar. And, and it may be a question that there's not an easy answer to, but what a lot of folks are wondering is they're saying, let's assume for argument's sake that we re reopen and we're a week or two into this and, and we find out that one of our employees has tested positive for COVID-19. What do we do? do? Do we have to shut the whole thing down? Do we have to somehow try? Because theoretically, this employee has been in contact with numerous other employees. So do you have a, I guess, a general answer to, to how we should deal with that situation? Sure. So part of your workplace safety plan should include a proactive infection plan. So this is a plan that addresses specifically how to deal with an employee who tests positive, an employee who's symptomatic but hasn't tested positive yet, or an asymptomatic employee who has been in close contact with a positive or confirmed case. So your plan is going to have to talk about specifically what are you going to do if there's a positive test. First of all, you're going to require your employee to notify you. You are going to communicate with the local health department about the positive test. You are going to have to do some contact tracing to try to determine who that employee has come in close contact with at your workplace in the prior 14 days. You're going to have to communicate with the employee about um, what leave they're, they're potentially entitled to or what leave they can have. Communicate with them about uh, steps you're taking uh, at your workplace. So for example, you're also gonna have to communicate with uh, other employees about the positive test while maintaining confidentiality uh, for, the per for the employee who tested positive. You're going to have to uh, engage in certain cleaning and disinfection procedures for areas where that um, employee was at your workplace. And you're going to have to document everything that you've done. It's, it's gonna be very important from, for a number of reasons to document specifically what steps you've taken once the employee tests positive. Thanks, Adam, that, that's huge help. In order to, um, to stay somewhat on the, the, the time allotment that we've been given, um, yep. what we'll do, Adam, is, is stick around because we may come back to you at the end if there's more questions. Um, I really appreciate it. Yep. So switching gears a little bit, um, I want to introduce another one of my partners, Paul Avery, uh, who is in our, uh, a partner in our business department. Paul is what I would call the pride of Elmira Heights. He is a, uh, like me, he grew up in that area, a proud alum of, of Thomas Edison High School, uh, and a tremendous lawyer. And, and he, Paul has been spending his time as of late, uh, really closely monitoring the, the various relief packages that are available, relief programs that have, are available uh, under the CARES Act. Most notably, what we're getting nearly all of our questions on from our clients mm -hmm. is about the PPP. And fortunately, or maybe unfortunately for Paul, because he hasn't had a ton of time to digest it, the SBA came out yesterday with some further guidance, which I think answers a lot of the questions that clients were, were really having trouble with 
and that we've been trying to walk them through um, in the absence of, of clear guidance. So hopefully what happened yesterday starts to clear things up a little bit for you. Uh, and certainly, uh, Paul will bring you up to speed on, on where we are as of, of May 14th. So, Paul, whenever you're ready, please take it away. Okay, thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. And, and thanks to the Chamber for putting this program on. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so, like Dan said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the PPP program. And, and really, you know, the most important new development happened yesterday. And, and we'll get right into that because that probably allowed some folks to you know, maybe rest a lot easier last night and have a good night's sleep. Um, so you know, as you know, when folks applied for the PPP loan, they had to make a certification of economic need. And you essentially had to say that you needed the loan funds in order to continue to support your ongoing operation. And because of the economic uncertainty created by the pandemic. And at first everyone rushed and, and flocked to apply because that seemed to be, to, to everyone, a pretty easy standard to meet. Um, the uncertainty created by the situation and how it was going to impact businesses and um, their revenues throughout the rest of this year, who, who could really say, who could really know how things would turn out, but, but everyone sort of feared the worst, so they, they all deemed it um, appropriate that they apply for the loan. Things got a lot more complicated on April 23rd, and that's when the SBA and the Treasury Department as part of a frequently asked questions document that they've been putting out and updating pretty regularly, um, this, this concept of um, the access to liquidity. So basically what it meant is at the time you applied for the loan, which may have been two weeks, three weeks, a month ago, you were supposed to have considered, even though the law didn't necessarily say this, whether you had access to other sources of liquidity. And if you did have access to it and decided that was not something you should tap into for one reason or another, because it would be detrimental to your business, you would also have to be certifying that you, know, you, you could not tap into it without really, really you know, negatively impacting your business operation. And of course, it was around that same time that you know, the Treasury Department and then the SBA confirmed with some of their guidance that anyone who received a PPP loan, uh, $2 million or more, was going to be subject to an audit. So, you know, initially, folks were concerned, well, maybe we'll get audited, maybe we won't. But for those who fell into the category of $2 million or more for their loans, now it was an issue of when they were there to be audited. So that really ramped up the risk, and there was a lot of uh, potential risks that you know, accompanied a false certification. So lots of hand-wringing, lots of sleepless nights for the past few weeks. Um, so what the SBA did because they basically were going back and changing the rules, um, saying at the time you applied, you had to consider this, even though most probably did not, they opened up a safe harbor. So they initially put a date out of May 7th. If you were to repay your PPP loan in full, then there would be no questions asked. You would made the certification in good faith and we'd all go on our merry way. Then because People weren't sure what that really meant and what it meant to have access to liquidity, what economic need for the loan really meant. The SBA, in response to, I think, a lot of pressure from the public and the small business community, extended that safe harbor deadline to today, May 14th. And so that brings us to you know, the long-awaited guidance that just came out yesterday. And I think it's a, a huge sigh of relief for, for most applicants, especially the smaller ones. Effectively, what the SBA issued yesterday is that if you are a borrower who received a loan less than $2 million, they are deeming you to have made that certification in good faith. So bottom line is you're basically absent, you know, committing fraud or something like that. You're in the clear. They don't have time to, to deal with looking at every single loan. And they basically said, if your loan amount is less than that, it can be assumed that you didn't really have access to a lot of other sources. So the, the good news also um, you know, applies to those who are in the larger category of loans over $2 million. For, for those folks, um, you, you will be audited, like, like I had said, but basically what the ramifications are now, if you are audited, if your audit results come back unfavorably, now, the SBA is going to require that you simply repay the loan in full, the original principal balance. 
and they're not going to refer the matter or take any other administrative enforcement actions against you. And that's really where the major concern you know, rested is, you know, most clients we've been speaking with said, look, if I can just give the money back, if it turns out I made my certification and, and they didn't buy it, then, hey, I can live with that. That's not the end of the world to me. But if we have to take some multiplier of my loan amount, if it was two or three times the loan amount for the damages, you know, that would be crippling to my business. I couldn't handle that you know, possibility. There was also the specter of you know, criminal prosecution. I, I don't think that that was probably very likely. But again, if, if you were in the category of you know, hooking your books or committing a fraud, there has been already a few instances where, where people had made up their employee counts and have already been criminally charged. So the threat you know, was real. So now based on this guidance from yesterday, I think it became a lot easier for folks, whether they have a loan below $2 million or above a $2 million threshold, it became obviously a lot easier to you know, reach the decision that you can keep the loan and, and feel pretty good about the consequences. Um, one other thing that was added to the frequently asked questions document last night was that May 14th deadline for when you could repay the loan in order to take advantage of the safe harbor. That's now been extended again to Monday, May 18th. So if you are a borrower who is still not terribly comfortable with the certification you made, whether because you didn't really think about whether you needed the money or not at the time you applied, or whether because you know, your situation perhaps has turned out more favorably than you anticipated, and you know there's going to be some Monday morning quarterbacking, then you, know, you really do want to consider or at least think about whether you want to pay the loan back by the 18th, because the, you know, the risk is, of course, you keep the funds, they determine that your certification was not made in good faith, then after you've already spent the money, they tell you you're not going to be able to have some or all of it forgiven. And, and that obviously can be uh, especially problematic for, for a business, that, you know, small business especially. So that's the latest guidance that, that came out last night and yesterday regarding to the repayment issue. We're still waiting for guidance on forgiveness. That's been in the works allegedly for about two weeks now. And you know, I suspect because of this repayment issue, that sort of got put in the back burner. But I mean, it's critical that we get some guidance on that soon. Many borrowers are getting close to the end of their eight week period for which they can seek forgiveness. And they still don't have answers to some of the simple questions that, that they've been asking us every day. I mean, one of the common ones we see is, you know, what, what happens if, you know, I let somebody go and they don't come back because there are certain factors in the calculation. If you restore your headcounts and your wages, your employees by June 30th, then you know, your forgiveness can be, uh, won't be subject to any reduction. So you know, the, the SBA did respond to at least one of those types of issues and scenarios. If, if you do offer someone who you laid off the opportunity to come back to work and they reject that offer, if you can document that, then that person will not count against you in your forgiveness calculation. So, you know, there's some parallels to that. What if someone just retires? What if, heaven forbid, they pass away? What if they have a health issue and they can't come back? You know, people are wondering whether those are going, those folks are going to count against them as well. And, you know, under that logic, I would say it's probably not likely, but that's another issue that we just don't yet have an answer to. Um, so moving forward, I would just run through a couple quick considerations and reminders to, to hopefully put everybody in the best position possible relating to their PPP loan. First, like I said, keep an eye out for guidance on forgiveness. The, the information is coming out pretty regularly, so make sure you stay informed to put yourself in the best position possible. Second, continue to document everything. Um, you should have a file that you've maintained that demonstrates your necessity in terms of why you needed the money. Hopefully, if, if you can say this, um, that without the money, you, you, you would have maybe let people go or had to furlough people, and because of the money, you didn't have to do that. That's an important thing. The models and projections you use to look at your, you know, the next three months, the next year, based on you know, expected drop in your business, what did that look like and how did that factor into the determination of need? And then when it comes to forgiveness itself, make sure you're carefully tracking how you spend the money that is used on permissible expenses. You know, a lot of people are setting up separate bank accounts 
They're making sure every penny from that account is used only on the payroll, the rent, the utilities, only those things that are permitted. And, and it might be a good idea, I've recommended to clients, reach out to your lenders and, and do so periodically. They probably don't have the information yet, but at some point, they might be able to tell you if they're going to have a specific form they're going to require you to fill out. They might tell you exactly what documentation they're going to want or need. And, you know, to the extent you don't have that ready to go, you'll have hopefully ample opportunity to get that in place. And then, you know, finally, if, if you, you did get a loan and you do have any concerns about the certification you made about your need for it, we've been counseling clients to sort of be smart about how they're using their money throughout the course of the rest of this year. So, you know, for example, discretionary spending, probably not the best time to pay your executives some big bonuses or to you know, have a lavish retreat for your company, things like that. Again, it doesn't mean just because you had those expenses throughout the rest of the year that you didn't need the money when you applied. But again, somebody, an auditor is going to look back and with hindsight, look at the situation and say, was your determination reasonable? You've done this well, you know, maybe you're, you know, your projections weren't reasonable. So um, that's something else that you know, we don't want to raise an auditor's eyebrow necessarily. So um, that, that's another piece of that. And, and then lastly, Dan, real quick, um, there's still program funds available at this point. So <laughs> if you've not yet applied, uh, you should consider doing so. Um, in light of yesterday's guidance, the risks have, you know, significantly been reduced. So, you know, if you were kind of nervous, maybe this changes the outcome or changes your uh, your analysis. And, and then secondly, there was also some new SBA guidance issued yesterday, which permits certain borrowers to actually seek an increase in the amount of the loans that they already received. So a lot of clients were struggling initially with the decision whether or not if they were a partnership, whether they could count all of the partner's compensation and not just their employee's compensation in determining their loan amount. And some included it, some did not. There was no real guidance on it. Ultimately, it turned out that that would have been a permissible portion of your loan to include the partner compensation. So now what the SBA is allowing um, is that you can go back to your lender and seek to increase your loan amount to factor in that partner compensation. And of course, you'd have to provide some documentation to them, um, but, but there's a, a new rule that was issued just last night that addresses that specific issue. And there's also some potential ability for seasonal employers um, to, to also increase their loan funds because they did change the, the rules for them a little bit as well at one point. And so that, that's it, Dan. Paul, oh, thanks. That, that's great. Um, one thing I think we just, we want to clarify, because I'm sure you've had these questions this morning already for clients as, as I have, but this new guidance last night, it doesn't mean there's no risk at all and you can do whatever you want to do with the money. It just, it, the, the concerns that folks had that we had no idea what it meant to need the money, for lack of better words. Now, the SBA is making very clear that particularly if you're under $2 million, you're not expected to draw on a line of credit or, or, or try to access some other type of capital market. That doesn't make your... Um, you know, that doesn't make your application fraudulent or expose you. It's basically an understanding that if you're taking a loan or requesting a loan under $2 million, you don't have access to those capital markets. And frankly, I think um, the way we interpret this is th this guidance, I think, is, is more addressed to potentially these publicly traded companies that have applied for and received these funds. And that, to me, I think is why they pushed the deadline back to to Monday for the safe harbor because a lot of these publicly traded companies this is a board decision that needs to be made so they need more time to figure that out but just to be clear it's not completely without risk clearly if you're committing fraud or or or, or some type of you know incorrect patently incorrect knowingly incorrect information on the application you're still subject to some penalty but if you're less than two million dollars you, you should be comfortable in the fact that you're not expected to borrow money from your owner or access a line of credit or anything like that. Am I, am I clear on that? No, no, you're exactly right, Dan. That's right. So, okay. you know, those who fall in that category, you know, by default, they don't really have to worry about those issues, whether they had access to some other, you know, capital. So, you know, those 
smaller businesses, again, can breathe a huge, huge sigh of relief. It, it, the real exposure for those in the category above $2 million, other than those in the category of committing fraud, for example, um, is really now just that you potentially have to repay the money and you can't get it forgiven, despite the fact that you spent it on what would have otherwise been a forgivable expense. So again, if you can live with that possibility, then really you've, you've taken out of the equation whether you really needed it or not, won't matter if you can live with that potential penalty at the end of the day. Got it. If that makes sense. Th thanks, Paul. And please stick around if you would. If We might want to circle back at the end to address uh, if we get any questions. But thank you very much. Um, sure. Now, last but certainly not least, my partner, Andy Bobrick. Uh, he's a member of our Labor and Employment Department here in Syracuse. Andy spends a lot of his time counseling small to mid-sized businesses uh, and larger businesses too on all aspects of, of labor and employment issues. Uh, not surprisingly, this, this COVID-19 crisis has given rise to a number of novel employment issues. And Andy is, is with us this morning to walk through and identify some of those issues and provide guidance as to how to avoid the common pitfalls based on the, the guidance and the questions that, that we're getting from our clients. So Andy, whenever you're ready, please take it away. Great, thank you, Dan. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. I certainly can't profess to have the same uh, Southern tier cred as my partner, Paul Avery or, or Danny, but uh, having worked with Dan a lot over the years, uh, I, I think I've unofficially been adopted by uh, both the Pouts and the Goff families. Uh, and um, I'm very grateful for that and consider uh, it a privilege to be able to speak with uh, some of you down in the Southern Tier, uh, one of my favorite places, uh, certainly in the state. Uh, I hope you're doing well. Um, myself, I look forward to, to getting back down there, uh, spending some time with folks. I do represent a number of clients there, but you know, particularly missing an opportunity to have some wings at the elbow room or stop by uh, Moretti's or Tonino's for a, a great dinner. Uh, as well as enjoying the, uh, the great people down there. So uh, if, if we take a look at the next slide, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about you know, some of the issues that I don't want us to lose sight on. I recognize there's a lot of things that uh, you as business owners and managers or organizational leaders have on your plate right now. There's a lot to do. Uh, as, as Paul and Adam mentioned, you know, with Adam, we got to worry about uh, reopening the precautions that we're going to take for employees and, and customers, et cetera, uh, have a plan about that. And with Paul, you know, we're, we're focused on the PPP program. Uh, if we're participating in that, compliance with that, and, and making sure we have all our T's crossed and I's dotted. But there's a lot of other issues that are still ongoing related to COVID. So I don't want to spend too much time on this because we do want to address your questions. But... Uh, I wanted to just mention a couple things for you to keep in your line of sight uh, as the, the weeks ensue here. And as we start to get back to, again, you know, a little bit tired of hearing it called the new normal, but whatever it's, it's going to be uh, moving forward in terms of uh, business operations, these are things that we're going to have to consider. First and foremost, you might be familiar with uh, the term WARN. And WARN is a statute that requires covered employers to provide advance notice to employees in the event of a triggering event. And there's state law on this here in New York, as well as federal law. Federal law generally deals with employers uh, who have 100 or more employees and where there's an impact to employees of 50 or more. State is, uh, the state law is a little more onerous, state WARN. It will apply to employers with 50 or more full-time employees. And the general triggering, triggering event is where you have a mass layoff or a plant closing that impacts 25 or more full-time employees. And that's just what I want to uh, have you keep in, in the back of your mind. And whenever um, you're considering a mass layoff or some other uh, broad-based personnel action, uh, temporary or otherwise, I want you to, to have this idea of warm go off in your head and say, all right, we need to check this and make sure um, whether or not we have an issue here. Uh, because if there is an issue and you haven't given proper advance notice, uh, that, can, that can create liability for your business. Now, in most cases to date, Warren hasn't really been a, a concern because if we've made any broad-based changes, they've been temporary in nature, certainly intended as temporary in nature. 
that's significant because under warrant, as long as the mass layoff or the plant closing is not expected to last, it doesn't last uh, more than six months, there's no triggering event. There are some exceptions for faltering businesses too, or unforeseen business circumstances um, that can arguably would apply um, in the situation of the COVID disaster and crisis. Uh, but again, just really issue spotting here. Another issue we're dealing with quite frequently is, is unemployment insurance. Uh, as you may be aware, the CARES legislation provided uh, really two things. One, a, a much broader range of eligibility factors for employees who cannot work uh, due to COVID, as well as an enhanced benefit of these employees, $600 on top of whatever else they would have been eligible for, for purposes of unemployment insurance, that additional $600 running until the end of July. Also don't want us to lose sight of our obligations under new federal and state law. Here in New York, if an employee is quarantined and subject to a quarantine order from a governmental agency, we as employers will be obligated to provide a range of either unpaid or paid time off from work, depending on our size. So again, if you have a quarantine order issued, uh, I want that light bulb to go off on top of your head that, hey, we could have a state law uh, paid sick leave act uh, issue arise here. We wanna comply with that. As well as under federal law, we have two buckets of new time. We have the emergency FMLA that provides up to 12 weeks of uh, leave for an employee who uh, has to stay at home and can't work because their children's school has been closed. Uh, likewise, there's an additional up to uh, 80 hours of leave time under the Federal Paid Sick Leave Act that will provide this benefit to employees in a much broader range of circumstances, such as where they are uh, recommended to be out of work by a healthcare provider or they're pursuing testing and diagnosis. Again, as we see the proliferation of testing, we're gonna see more and more testing. What we're gonna see, I believe, is more and more positive diagnoses and uh, more quarantine orders. So just, again, keep that in mind. We're not past that issue yet, and very likely we're gonna have continuing compliance issues. Just a quick mention, again, uh, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir uh, on this here, but we've gotta be mindful that whatever decisions that we're making here, and, and I, granted they're oftentimes emergent in nature and certainly critical uh, in response to this very dynamic business environment we're having to deal with, but all our decisions need to be still effectuated for non-discriminatory reasons. And by that, I mean, let's say we need to cut our workforce temporarily in half because there just isn't demand right now uh, for a particular operation. Well, who are we gonna pick? What, what half of our workforce is going to go out and will we have the documentation in place to show the legitimate non-discriminatory reasons that we use to select who stays and who goes? Finally, uh, it now could be a good time for us to review our, our policies and procedures in our handbook. Uh, again, we're dealing with a new and different environment in terms of employee attendance at work, absenteeism, uh, and we need to figure out a way to still maintain our operations uh, and maintain our uh, place as uh, a preferred spot of employment, right? Where employees wanna come and they wanna work and we wanna make sure they're comfortable. This is, do we need to make adjustments to our leave policies, our attendance policies, our tardiness policies, other policies in there to make sure that we provide uh, the flexibility that, that we can as, as a business, but also that our employees will appreciate. So Dan, lo those are just some of the, I think, key points here that we wanna keep in mind uh, with respect to COVID and, and the weeks ahead. Certainly not an exhaustive list, but you know, we wanted to spot a few things for folks here. Andy, that's great. Thanks so much. Um, the one thing before we get into a Q&A, I do want to leave a few minutes, but but particularly with our service industry clients, a lot of restaurant clients and, and bar clients that I've heard from, the one question that continues to be asked time and time and time again is, what if an employee who's been furloughed is receiving unemployment insurance? And we're seeking to bring them back. Um, largely, it, the motivation is in order to get the, to the 75% figure for the PPP loans. What if I want to bring uh, an employee back and, and they refuse or they don't want to come back because 
potentially they're doing better financially on unemployment. How is an employer, uh, how, how do we deal with that? It, it is a, a good question, Dan. It's one that I'm getting multiple times a day as, again, we're, we're restarting here. Um, and I really think it's, it's become a complex question largely because of the enhanced unemployment benefit that people are getting, the $600 uh, per week on top of whatever they're, they're otherwise eligible for, which in many cases can result in the employee actually making more than they would if they worked. Uh, let, me, let me get to that and I think some strategies, Dan, on this. Um, I, I think uh, more generally employers are going to face questions or concerns when they do call back employees. Uh, and I think you want to uh, address those in, in a careful manner. Once again, I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but regardless of the circumstance, I think we wanna have a meaningful discussion with the employee to understand their concerns about coming back to work. I would prefer that that be over the phone rather than by text or email, because we really need to gather some information. I'll, I'll explain why too. Second, we want to start from a place of empathy and understanding as employers. The fact is people are genuinely afraid of, of being infected, uh, coming back to work and potentially being infected. And even if they, they themselves uh, prove to be asymptomatic, they're still afraid of infecting someone else who they care about. And ultimately, how we handle this situation will depend on the information that we receive from the employee with respect to their concerns. So, uh, let me go back to your question. Right? If, for example, an employee is simply unwilling to work for the sole reason that they could collect more in unemployment insurance, uh, again, given the extra $600 per week that they're eligible for until the end of July, uh, then they would make working. Well, federal guidance is quite clear that that's not permitted, uh, that that could constitute a fraud, right? Simply uh, quitting work or refusing to work to collect unemployment benefits is not what it's intended for. Um, furthermore, in that situation, I think we have to evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis as an employer, but um, you know, we have, uh, if that's the sole reason, we have legitimate grounds to, to question and um, to take appropriate action with respect to the employee um, in order to try to uh, maintain the employment relationship and certainly maintain our, our operations as well. But again, it, there's no real one-size-fits-all solution here. I think it's going to depend on your business, uh, depend on the extent to which you want to maintain connection with your employees who may be furloughed or laid off now, uh, and your expected need for uh, such, such support moving forward. On the other hand, right, if you have an employee who comes to you who can't work because they have uh, young children at home right now whose schools have been closed due to COVID, then we need to assess that situation much differently. Uh, in that situation, we may have uh, circumstances where the employee is eligible for either the emergency FMLA and or the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act under the FFCRA, and if the employer is smaller than uh, 500 employees. Uh, alternatively, uh, even in that situation, if there is an eligibility, the employee could be uh, entitled to collect unemployment under these broader range of circumstances. Along the same lines, if you have an employee who raises their own health condition as an issue or the serious health condition of a spouse or a child, then uh, we wanna take a step back. Again, this is a situation where I want that light bulb to go off in, in the business leader's mind and say, all right, we need to evaluate this very carefully. Uh, we need to evaluate it for potential coverage under the Family and Medical Leave Act, that there may be protected leave available to the employee um, based on the circumstances that have been described to us. Additionally, we're going to want to have an interactive discussion with the employee about the nature, uh, expected duration of the condition, if it's their own, and how it may impact their ability to perform the essential functions of their job, because we need to identify whether or not uh, we can provide a reasonable accommodation to that employee based on the, the health care concern that they've identified. So again, not no one size fits all, but try to give you a few examples, Dan, of how we how we address this. Um, you know, I think that it's these are going to be issues that that continue to uh, pop up uh, as we ramp business back up. 
uh, and as we have employees out and we're going to be calling them back. Thanks, Andy. That is a, a huge help. And I think that's important for folks to understand that a lot of these nuanced situations, it, it's not going to be as simple as either do A or do B. Um, I, I think there's going to be a lot more to it. So, so thank you for that. Uh, what I would like to do, we, we are about five minutes before the top of the hour. And, and as I said, I, I see that Paul Avery is, has answered a couple questions on the chat. And I'm going to go back to Adam Master Leo in a moment because I know that that he's there's a few questions in, in the chat uh, that pertain to his area of expertise. But what I want to say before that is uh, our contact information is, is on the slides, and, and we're going to send you uh, a couple of materials. We're going to email everybody, all participants, some materials. And I would encourage all of you, particularly those folks on the phone who we may not have had an opportunity to get to your question, please reach out to me, reach out to any of these other three gentlemen. Uh, with any specific questions you have, because again, a lot of these are th th these broad questions. They're not easily answerable unless we get some factual background and we can kind of dig into to that. So, but please, we encourage you to reach out to any one of us. Um, but Adam, have, have you seen a couple of questions in the chat that you can jump in on? Dan. Um, so first, first off, someone asked. Um, is the template the New York State has released specific to just one phase one businesses or is it valid for all phases? That's a really good question. Um, I've looked at all of the templates. So there's a template for each industry uh, in phase one and the templates are identical. So the state is using the same template for construction, for manufacturing, for agriculture, et cetera. Um, if you are an essential business, there isn't specific guidance for you, but I would say a safe course of action is to go through that template because the state is using the same template for all businesses, but you know, we don't know yet. Um, another question asked was uh, where at daycare, it, it is impossible social distance from children. What do you recommend? Uh, again, you are an essential business, so you can continue to operate. You are going to need to adopt one of these plans workplace safety plans, and your plan will acknowledge the limitations that you have uh, due to the nature of your work, um, but it will, it, you will still have to have one of those plans. Um, the last question I think that's relevant to reopening is uh, somebody asked if uh, you were an independent contractor at a local real estate brokerage, do the same rules for getting back to the office apply to you? And the answer is yes, uh, you are a business. And so you'd be subject to the same phased reopening and reopening requirements as everybody else. Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, and, and what I'd like to do, it's 1058, so pretty good timing. Um, I'll turn it back over to Emily. And again, um, you all have our contact information. We can't thank you enough for, for spending an hour with us today. Hopefully we, we provided some benefit and some value to you, uh, at least to explain what's going on. And, and explain some of the issues that you need to be mindful of as we move forward. But again, I know it's cliche. We are truly, truly all in this together. And we're going to continue to work through these issues as they come up. So thank you again to the chamber. Thank you again to Emily. Uh, and, and hopefully, fingers crossed, assuming we didn't embarrass ourselves too much, uh, this will be the first of many presentations uh, that, the next one may be in person so I can get my friend Andy uh, down to Moretti's or Tonino's or Elbow again. So thanks again, Emily, and, and thank you all, and, and please continue good health. Many thanks to you, Dan, and to Andrew and Adam and Paul, and we thank everyone for joining us today. We truly appreciate your time and hope everybody has a nice day.